Our presentation is about the mysterious hijacking of D.B. Cooper. So what happened? So on November 24th, 1971, a man who looked to be about six feet tall bought a $20 ticket for Northwest Airlines on flight 305. He said his name was Dan Cooper. Shortly after takeoff from Portland, he handed a note to a flight attendant in which he claimed to have a bomb in his briefcase. Cooper then demanded four parachutes and $200,000. Today, that would be well worth over $1 million. Cooper also demanded four parachutes so the authorities would think he was taking hostages and they wouldn't shoot at him. His victims were the 36 passengers on flight 305. After the plane landed in Seattle, Cooper released these 36 passengers when authorities provided the money and the parachutes. However, he forced two pilots, a flight engineer and a flight attendant, to remain on the plane. After it refueled, he ordered the pilots to fly to Mexico City. Once above Mexico City, Cooper lowered the rear steps and jumped. He then disappeared. All right, um, so who did it? Uh, his alias was D.B. Cooper. Um, he was wearing a black raincoat, a dark suit, and wraparound sunglasses sunglasses, which were like sunglasses that just wrapped around your head. Um, and he disappeared after. So, like, the plane landed at Seattle where authorities handed over the items and evacuated most of the passengers. Then he made them head, or then he headed towards Mexico City. A bit later, he jumped out in the, into a storm and was never seen or heard of since then. And now we have, we have a video. When he got on a plane in Portland, Oregon last night, he was just another passenger. Okay, but today, after hijacking a Northwest Airlines jet, ransoming the passengers in Seattle, then making a getaway by parachute somewhere between there and Reno, Nevada, the description on one wire service, master criminal. Bill Curtis reports. 36 passengers got off the jetliner in Seattle last night, left aboard four crew members and the hijacker, dressed in a business suit demanding $200,000, and carrying a plain briefcase which he told the crew had explosives. With the full ransom collected from Seattle banks and four parachutes aboard, the plane headed for Reno. It took three and a half hours, slow for a jet, but the hijacker had given detailed flight instructions. The rear stairwell was open all the way, it arrived at Reno in shreds. The crew, here being debriefed by the FBI, was told to fly low over Oregon's flatlands with the flaps down. The speed dropped to 200 miles per hour. Somewhere, the hijacker parachuted away with the money. The crew had little to say. Oh, uh, we gave the information to the authorities, and uh, they just don't want to discuss it any further. Have you been told by the FBI not to discuss? No, they handle their investigation, and uh, my company would rather have it released to them. Tina, were you with the with the rest of the crew during during the the flight after you left the ground the last time? Yes, I went up to the cockpit. None of you were with inside of the hijacker, right? Right. We already talked about it, and the captain. No. Okay. Oh, uh, how did you surmise that he was not on the plane when he landed in Reno? Well, a search was made of the plane immediately uh, after landing. As we understood it, he could have gotten off as the plane taxi before it came up here. How did the crew know he wasn't on when it touched the ground? The crew couldn't know that, but we have the airport covered. the authority not searching for covers the mountains in Northern California and Nevada, a hostile terrain for any parachute drop, especially at night. Police believe he left the 727 in the flatlands of Oregon or Washington. But they are still looking in four states, even around the airport. Authorities began their search here, thinking the hijacker may have jumped off at the end of the runway as the plane touched down. But the problem is more complex. A daring parachute escape from a flying 727 somewhere between Reno and Seattle, Washington. Bill Curtis, CBS News, Reno. So no one's... Uh, no one knows who D.B. Cooper is. They still haven't solved the hijacking. But, um, and it's one of the only, like, unknown piracy events in U.S. history that they still haven't figured it out. So the setting, 
This event took place at a remote setting in a plain above Seattle. Um, the hijacking occurred at night during a thunderstorm, which created a very mysterious and gothic setting. And then, so this, if this event was a movie, the viewers would easily be able to tell something bad was about to happen. The hijacker, the hijacker was mysterious, a mysterious man wearing a black raincoat, a dark suit, and wrap around sunglasses. The flight occurred at night and during thunderstorms. All these features would predict that something bad was about to happen. All right, so evil has a real force. I mean, um, it just shows like the whole story, uh, how he was pretty much evil and how it's like a real force. Um, like he, he took hostages and didn't really care for their lives. Anything like that were to happen. Um, he hijacked the plane with people on it. Uh, like normal people wouldn't do that type of stuff and wouldn't put like other people's uh, lives on the line. Uh, so it shows the real force of evil in him. And it just shows like how much he's also struggling on the inside because you know, he had to have been going through something to have to do that. And um, yeah, so he, he just put uh, a lot of people in danger and yeah.